uninvited brothers. Omri was not supposed to ride his bicycle in the road, but then he wasn't supposed to ride it on the pavement either. Not fast at any rate. So he compromised. He rode it slowly on the pavement as far as the corner, then bumped down off the curb and went like the wind. The hardware shop was still open. He bought the seed tray and the seeds and was just paying for them when he noticed something. On the seed packet, under the word marrow, was written another word in brackets, squash. So one of the three sisters was marrow. On impulse, he asked the shopkeeper, do you know what maize is? Maize, son? That's sweet corn, isn't it? Have you some seeds of that? Outside, standing by Omri's bike, was Patrick. Hi. Hi, I saw you going in. What did you get? Omri showed him. More presents for the Indian? Patrick asked sarcastically. Well, sort of. If... If what? If I can keep him long enough till they grow. Patrick stared at him, and Omri stared back. I've been to Yaps, said Patrick. I bought you something. Yeah? What? asked Omri hopefully. Slowly, Patrick took his hand out of his pocket and held it in front of him and opened the fingers. In his palm lay a cowboy on a horse with a pistol in one hand pointing upward, or what would have been upward if it hadn't been lying on its side. Omri looked at it silently. Then he shook his head. I'm sorry, I don't want it. Why not? Now you can play a proper game with the Indian. They'd fight. Isn't that the whole idea? They might hurt each other. There was a pause, and then Patrick leaned forward and asked very slowly and very loudly, How can they hurt each other? They are made of plastic. Listen, said Omri, and then stopped, and then started again. The Indian isn't plastic. He's real. Patrick heaved a deep, deep sigh put the cowboy back in his pocket. He'd been friends with Omri for years, ever since they'd started school. They knew each other very well, just as Patrick knew when Omri was lying. He also knew when he wasn't. The only trouble was that this was a non-lie he couldn't believe. I want to see him, he said. Omri debated with himself. He somehow felt that if he didn't share his secret with Patrick, their friendship would be over. He didn't want that. And besides, the thrill of showing his Indian to someone else was something he could not do without for much longer. Okay, come on. Going home, they broke the law even more, riding on the road and with Patrick on the crossbar. They went around the back way by the alley in case anyone happened to be looking out of the window. Omri said, he wants a fire. We can't make one indoors. You could put, you could on a tin plate, like, um, like for indoor fireworks, said Patrick. Omri looked at him. Let's collect some twigs. Patrick picked up a twig about a foot long. Omri laughed. That's no good. They've got to be tiny twigs, like this. And he picked some slivers off of the privet hedge. Does he want the fire to cook on? Asked Patrick slowly. Yes. Then that's no use. The fire made of those would burn out in a couple of seconds. Omri hadn't thought of that. What you need, said Patrick, is a little ball of tar that burns for ages, and you could put the twigs on top to look like a real campfire. That's a brilliant idea. I know where they've got, they've been tarring a road, too, said Patrick. Come on, let's go. No. Why not? I don't believe in him yet. I want to see. All right, but first I have to give this stuff to my dad. There was a further delay when his father at first insisted on Omri filling the treat seed tree tray with compost and planting the seeds in it then and there but when Omri gave him the corn seed as a present he said well thanks oh all right I can see you're bursting to get away you can do the planting tomorrow before school Omri and Patrick rushed upstairs at the top Omri stopped cold his bedroom door which he always shut automatically was wide open and just inside crouching side by side with their backs to him were his brothers. They were so absolutely still that Omri knew they were watching something. He couldn't bear it. They had come into his room without his permission, and they had seen his Indian. And now they would tell everybody his secret, his precious secret, his alone to keep or share was a secret no more. Something broke inside him, and he heard himself scream, Get out of my room! Get out of my room! Both boys spun around. Shut up, you'll frighten him said Adiel at once. 
Gillen came in to look for his rat and he found it. And then he saw this absolutely fabulous little house you've made and he called me in to look at it. Omri looked at the floor. The seed tray with the long house, now nearly finished, had been moved into the center of the room. It was that they had been looking at. A quick glance all around showed no sign of Indian or horse, but Gillen's tame white rat was on his shoulder. I can't get over it, Adiel went on. How on earth did you do it without using any glue or anything? It's all done with tiny little threads and pegs. And look, Gillen, it's all made of real twigs and bark. It's absolutely terrific. He said with such awestruck admiration in his voice that Omri felt ashamed. I didn't, he began. But Patrick, who had been gaping at the long house in amazement, gave a heavy nudge that nearly knocked him over. Yes, said Omri. Well, would you mind leaving now and taking the rat? You're not to let him in here. This is my room, you know. And this is my magnifying glass, you know, echoed Gil Gillen. But he was obviously too overcome with admiration to be angry with Omri for pinching it. He was using it now to examine the fine details of the building. I knew you were good at making things, he said, but this is uncanny. You must have fingers like a fairy to tie those witchy little knots. What's that? he asked suddenly. They'd all heard it, a high, faint whinny coming from under the bed. Omri was galvanized into action. At all costs, he must prevent their finding out now. He flung himself on his knees and pretended to grope under the bed. It's nothing, only that little clockwork dolphin I got on my Christmas stocking, he burbled. I it must have wound it up and it suddenly started clicking. You know how they do. It's quite creepy sometimes when they start suddenly clicking. By this time, he leapt up again and was almost pushing the two older boys out of the room. Why are you in such a hurry to get rid of us? asked Gillen. Just go. You know you have to get out of my room when I ask you. But he could hear the little horse winning again, and it didn't sound a bit like a dolphin. That sounds just like a pony, said Adiel. Oh, beard, it's a pony, a tiny witchy pony under my bed, said Omri mockingly. At last they went, not without glancing back suspiciously several times, and Omri slammed the door, bolted it, and leaned against it with closed eyes. Is it a pony? whispered Patrick agog. Omri nodded, then he opened his eyes, lay down again, and peered under the bed. Give me that flashlight from the chest of drawers. Patrick gave it to him and lay beside him. They peered together as the beam probed the darkness. Crumbs. Patrick breathed reverently. It's true. The horse was standing, seemingly alone, whinnying. When the light hit him, he stopped and turned his head. Omri could see a pair of leggings behind him. It's all right, little bear, it's me, said Omri. Slowly, a crest of feathers, then a pair of eyes appeared over the top of the horse's back. Who others? he asked. My brothers, it's okay, they didn't see you. Little bear, here, coming. Take horse. Run. Hide. Good. Come on out and meet my friend, Patrick. Little Bear jumped astride the horse and rode proudly out, wearing his new cloak and headdress. He gazed up imperiously at Patrick, who gazed back in wonder. Then he nodded to Patrick, who several times, to, who tried several times to say something, but his voice just came out as a squeak. Omri's friend, Little Bear's friend, said Little Bear magnanimously. Patrick swallowed, swallowed. His eyes seemed in danger of popping right out of his head. Little Bear waited politely, but when Patrick didn't speak, he rode over to the seed tray. The brothers had brought it out from behind the crate. They'd been careful, but the ramp had got moved. Omri hurried to put it back, and Little Bear rode the horse up it, dismounted, and tied it to the halt by its halter to the post he had driven into the compost. Then he went calmly on with his work on the longhouse. Patrick licked his lips, swallowed twice more, and croaked out, He's real. He's a, he's a real, live Indian. I told you. How did it happen? Don't ask me. Something to do with this cupboard, or maybe it's the key. It's very old. You lock plastic people inside, and they come alive. Patrick goggled at him. You mean it's not only him? You can do it with any toy? Only plastic ones. 
an incredulous grin spread across Omri's face. Then what are we waiting for? Let's bring loads of things to life, whole armies. And he sprang toward the biscuit tins. Omri grabbed him. No, wait, it's not so simple. Patrick, his hands already full of soldiers, was making for the cupboard. Why not? Because they'd all, don't you see? They'd be real. Real? What do you mean? Little Bear is not a toy. He's a real man. He really lived. Maybe he's still, I don't know, he's still in the middle of his life somewhere in America. In 17-something or other. He's from the past. Omri struggled to explain as Patrick looked blank. I don't get it. Listen, Little Bear told me about his life. He's fought in wars and scalped people and grown stuff to eat like marrows and stuff and had a wife. She died. He doesn't know how he got here, but he thinks it's magic and he accept, accepts magic. He believes in it. He thinks I'm some kind of spirit or something. What I mean, Omri persisted as Patrick's eyes strayed longingly to the cupboard, is that if you put all those men in there, when they came to life, they'd be real men with real lives of their own, from their own times and countries, talking their own languages. You couldn't just set them up and make them do what you wanted them to. They'd do what they wanted to. Or they might get terrified and run away. Or, well, one I tried with, an old Indian, actually died of, of fright when he saw me. Look, if you don't believe me, said and Omri opened the cupboard. There lay the body of the old chief, now made of plastic, but still unmistakably dead. And not dead the way plastic soldiers were made to look dead, but the way real people look. Crumpled up. Empty. Patrick picked it up, turning it in his hand. He, put the soldiers, he had put the soldiers down by now. This isn't the one you bought at lunchtime? Yes. Crumbs. You see? But where's his headdress? Uh, Little Bear took it. He says he's chief now. It's made him even more bossy and difficult than before, said Omri, using a word his mother often used when he was insisting on having his own way. Patrick put the dead Indian down hurriedly and wiped his hand on the seat of his jeans. Maybe this isn't such fun as I thought. Omri considered for a moment. No, he agreed soberly. It's not fun. They stared at Little Bear. He had finished the shell of the longhouse now. Taking off his headdress, he tucked it under his arm, stooped, and entered through the low doorway at one end. After a moment, he came out and looked up at Omri. Little bear hungry, he said. You get deer? Moose? Bear? No. He scowled. I say get. Why you not get? The shops are shut. Besides, added Omri, shake thinking he sounded rather feeble, especially in front of Patrick. I'm not sure I like the idea of having bears shambling around my room or of having to kill them. I'll give you meat and a fire and you can cook it and that'll have to do. Little Bear looked baffled for a moment. Then he swiftly put, out, put on the headdress and drew himself up to his full height of almost three inches, three and a quarter with the feathers. He folded his arms and glared at Omri. Little Bear chief now. Chief hunts, kills own meat. Not take meat, others kill. If not hunt, lose skill with bow. For today, you give meat. Tomorrow, go shop, get bear, plastic. Make real, I hunt. Not here, he added, looking up scornfully at the distant ceiling. Out, under sky. Now, fire. Patrick, who had been crouching, stood up. He too seemed to be under Little Bear's spell. I'll run and get the tar, he said. No, wait a minute, said Omri. I've got another idea. He ran downstairs. Fortunately, the living room was empty. In the coal scuttle beside the open fireplace was a packet of fire lighters. He broke a fairly large bit off and wrapped it up in a scrap of newspaper. Then he went to the kitchen. His mother was standing at the sink peeling apples. Omri hesitated, then went to the refrigerator. Don't eat, not, don't eat now, Omri. It's nearly supper time. Just a tiny bit? he said. There was a lovely chunk of raw meat on a plate. Omri sniffed his fingers, wiping them hard on his sweater to get the stink of the fire lighter off them, then took a big carving knife from the drawer and with an anxious glance at his mother's back began sawing a corner off the meat. Luckily it was steak and cut easily. Even so, he had nearly the whole plate off the shelf and onto the floor before he got his corner off. 
His mother swung around just as he closed the refrigerator. A tiny bit of what? she asked. She often reacted late to things he said. Nothing, he said, hiding the raw bit of meat in his hand. Mum, could I borrow a tin plate? I haven't got such a thing. Yes, you have, the one you bought Adiel to go camping. That's in Adiel's room somewhere. I haven't got it. A tiny bit of what? But Omri was already on his way upstairs. Adiel was in his room. He would be, doing his homework. What do you want? He asked the second Omri crept in. That plate, you know, your camping one? Oh, that, said Adiel, going back to his French. Well, can I have it? Yeah, I suppose so. It's, it's over there somewhere. Omri found it eventually in an old knapsack, covered with disgusting bits of baked beans, dry and hard as cement. He hurried across to his own room. Whenever he'd been away from it for even a few minutes, he felt his heart beating in panic as he opened the door for fear of what he might find or not find. The burden of constant worry was beginning to wear, wear him out. But all was, all was as he had left it this time. Patrick was crouching near the seed tray. Little Bear was directing him to take the tops off several jars of poster paint while he himself fashioned something in almost too small to see. It's a paintbrush, whispered Patrick. He cut a bit of his own hair and he's tying it to a tiny scrap of wood he found about the size of a big splinter. Pour a bit of paint into the lid so he can reach to dip, said Omri. Meanwhile, he was scraping the dry beans off the plate with his nails. He took the fragment of fire lighter and the twigs out of his pocket and arranged them in the center of the plate. He washed the bit of meat in his bedside water glass. He had a wonderful idea for a spit to cook it on. From a flat box in which his first erector set had once been laid out, but now was in chaos. He took a rod, ready bent into a handle shape, and pushed this through the meat. Then, from small bits of the set, he quickly made a sort of stand for it to rest on, with legs each side of the fire so that the meat hung over the middle of it. Let's light it now, said Patrick, who was getting very excited again. Little Bear, come and see your fire, said Omri. Little Bear looked up from his paints and then ran down the ramp across the carpet and vaulted onto the edge of the plate. Omri struck a match and lit the fire lighter, which flared up at once with a bluish flame, engulfing the twigs and the meat at once. The twigs gave off a gratifying crackle while they lasted, but the fire lighter gave off a very ungratifying stench, which made Little Bear wrinkle up his nose. Stink, he cried. Spoil meat. No, it won't, Omri said, turning turn the handle of the spit, Little Bear. Evidently, he wasn't much used to spits, but he soon got the hang of it. The trunk chunk of steak turned and turned in the flame and soon lost its red raw look and began to go gray and then brown. The good juicy smell of roasting beef began to compete with the spiritous reek of the fire lighter. Mmm, said Little Bear appreciatively, turning till the sweat ran off his face. Meat. He had thrown off his chief's cloak and his chest shone red. Patrick couldn't take his eyes off him. Please, Omri, he whispered. Couldn't I have one? Couldn't I choose just one, a soldier or anything I liked, and make him come to life in your cupboard?